Um, thank you for getting up uh, and joining us this morning. Um, there is, if you like, a sort of perfect symmetry to what we've done in this newsroom in the last, uh, I suppose, um, uh, 15 hours, which is uh, last night, uh, Jonathan Sachs, Lord Sachs, uh, the uh, former chief rabbi, was here, and the discussion was fundamentally about the nature of morality and whether or not there was space between what the market does and what the state does to, re to reconcile it with some kind of social morality, a green set of values. This morning, if you like, we've gone directly from morality to an in-depth think about the market. And I suppose if we can actually marry the conversation we had last night and the conversation we're going to have this morning with Sir Terry Leahy, we might have something that you could really work with. Um, I hope that in the course of the coming hour, you will feel that you get to do what we feel, or I've always felt, is one of the greatest benefits of journalism, is to be able to speak directly and sort of test thoughts and ideas with someone who's really done it, someone who's at the heart of the way in which our country and our economy works. Um, uh, Terry, as you know, is, is one of those figures who not only transformed his business, but our understanding of business. Came in when uh, Tesco was, what, about two-fifths, uh, sorry, one-fifth one of the market and ended up being one-third of it. In an industry like retailing, where things move by tiny fractions of percentages, this was a revolution, and it proved to be a revolution in the way in which we shopped, what our expectations of life and retailing could be, but also then ended up creating a whole new range of expectations on business to be responsible for change. And so, before I just start with Terry, I wanted to make sure that people understood the nature of a thinking. If you've not been to one before, it's got a very simple theory to it, which is there are enough, heaven knows, panel discussions in the world where you get some stage on a stage and everyone sits silently uh, until the last sort of three or four minutes uh, when they gingerly ask a question. Our system is that we want this to be like a real news meeting. It's held in our newsroom because, and this is our newsroom, today we'll be uh, working on what we're putting out for this week. We want it to operate like a news meeting. We want everyone to weigh in. We want to hear your views. We want to be informed by your expertise, your experience. So we do have one rule in a thinking, and that is no questions. And this may seem like an eccentric thing to do when you've got a lot of things to learn from uh, someone like Terry, but the reason is this. We really think that actually in the exchange of people's points of view, we will get a better understanding of some of the issues at stake. And I've been to, I'm sure we all have, enough events where actually people ask questions, but they're really a statement. We thought, why don't we just go straight to it and actually get people's uh, points of view. We've got uh, an hour. Um, uh, a newsroom, I like to say, is an argument on the way to a deadline. That's the deadline. On the far right, our tortoise, uh, Agatha, when she hits that uh, end of the screen, the flag goes up, the race is won. It's always won by Agatha. So you better uh, make sure that you uh, get involved early. So please don't wait to weigh in. Please do weigh in uh, uh, from the start. One other just health and safety thing, which is we've got a uh, set of microphones and uh, cameras here. So uh, while we want this to be as casual as possible, we just want you to know that uh, we record it and we can uh, stream it too. Um, before I come to, to Terry, I suppose, on the thing that's on the front of all of our minds today, I just wanted to get a sense of the room but how many people here think that we really do live in an age of the new consumer, that, that the fundamentals of consumption have changed, that it's not just about affordability, quality, convenience, that now, if you like, the politics of consumption really do inform your choices as consumers? How many people think that that the business of being a consumer has fundamentally changed and has, if you like, a political element to it. Who thinks that there is a, quote, unquote, new consumer? And who here thinks that actually the nature of consumption, the nature of buying, fundamentally hasn't changed? Well, that's quite interesting. All right, and then just also give a taste of where we're going to go, I hope, in this conversation. How many people think that we are a week away from the budget, the focus, as you know, with this government, among other things, is not just Brexit, but, quote-unquote, levelling up? How many people have confidence that a government can fundamentally change economic opportunities within the map of the UK? 
that we can change the, the regional dynamics of, our, of the UK economy? Who, who believes that governments, if they put their mind to it, can really change that? How many people think that they are, if you like, swimming against the tide of urbanisation, education, aspiration, and they can't? Oh, brilliant. OK, well, we're sort of an evenly divided uh, group, relatively evenly divided. As you can see, uh, it's not an entirely mathematic ca calculation. Terry, let's start, if we can, because I'd like to come to both of those subjects, consumerism, and I'd like to come uh, to, to the subject of, of how we reshape the economy. But can we just start with... Imagine you're the chief executive again today of a company of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, in fact, of employees with a national reach. What, do, what are your responsibilities and what are the limits of your responsibilities as regards the coronavirus? Um, well, I mean, you're a citizen, so you follow, take your main lead from government and from scientists. Um, Sometimes, because of your industry knowledge, you may be a little bit ahead of government's understanding on things like supply chains. I remember the fuel crisis around about 2000. Um, the government hadn't fully appreciated how modern supply chains were much more critical, much leaner than, than they'd imagined. They were still a little bit in the era of stockpiling coal and having weeks for a dispute. Whereas even then, in 2000, supply chains were measured in days. Mm. Now, you know, maybe even hours. But, but so, so that's the approach. I, I think all businesses, large and small, uh, are trying to assess four things. You know, one is what will be the impact on demand. Uh, two is what will be the effect on the supply chains that I rely on. Th three is what does it mean for the people who work in the business. Um, uh, and, and four is, um, you know, can I finance the business? And, that, you know, as we were saying earlier, James, that particularly applies to private equity, which is a big part of the economy and has a different financial structure mm. than other businesses. Uh, and and, ju and just, <coughs> can we just, can we just do those last two first, if you like? The liquidity issue is, I think, the thing that people or normal people like me just wouldn't see, which is that... When I would have thought that when you hit a crisis like this, banks will actually provide more money, they would see it as an opportunity. But is it actually the case that they too get nervous and oh, it's hard so, to find exactly. money? So banks become risk averse, and, that, and that's you know, how modern economies grow and, uh, and, uh, and, and shrink, because it's, it's a confidence. Confidence fills the economy. People want to lend, want to take risk. When things start flashing red, people withdraw well, to protect their positions uh, and become risk averse, and that you know begins with the banks. Have you seen any of that yet, or you just or you just know the cycle? I, you're beginning to see some of it, yeah, already in terms of uh, financing deals becoming a little bit harder. Interesting. And then just tell me about this: the people who work in the business. So we had a conversation. I don't know whether people saw. Last week there was a company in Canary Wharf when one person had come back, and I can't remember whether it was from Northern Italy or Tenerife, but on the basis of that they shut the entire block yeah. and sent, I think, 300-odd people home. And we were trying to debate the morality of it, as in, are you, are you a moral leader if you're super cautious but also super disruptive, or you're a moral leader if you actually contain the anxiety and the fear. What's, what, what's the responsibility there in terms of the people that, as you say, work in the business? It, it's, it's a very difficult judgment. Um, I can understand if people's first reaction is, why take any risk? But you quite quickly come to the point where, hang on, you know, the modern economy, modern society needs to function. So if you decide not to turn up for work, what does that say about your expectation on a policeman or a train driver or mm. a health worker? Presumably you'd expect them to, to turn up yeah. for work. So I, I think the current government's advice, which is to, you know, go take precautions but go about your normal uh, job and your normal uh, day is, is the right advice. And it does come a point that your responsibility is to do your work. 
Uh, and um, there is, I think, a danger of getting ahead of the science, the epidemiology, and uh, it could hit society and the economy harder than it needs to at this stage. Can, can I just ask, I, if anyone's got a view on this, I'm really interested to, we're really interested to try and gauge what the right thing is, but can I just ask, just as a, just a slightly clumsy way of trying to gauge where our sort of practical response should be, who here thinks that if they worked in an office, let's assume that it was like this, it was open plan, and that someone had been on holiday to northern Italy in the last six weeks, you would like us to close down the office and not, uh, and no one comes to work? No. Nobody? OK. If someone had been to Tenerife and they had stayed in the hotel where it turned out that there had been incidents of the coronavirus, does anybody like us to close the office? They should stay at home. They should, be, they should stay at home. They should self-isolate. And if someone in the office has actually um, got the coronavirus, we've had an identified case, what would you do then? Who, who would like to see that and then us close the office and not, not come in, people not come in? So, okay, so, so sorry, and a smattering, even then that would be a tiny proportion, fewer than 10% of people in the room. So our basic, so, so is the overwhelming view of the of people in the room that actually, even if we get instance, yes, ma'am, what are you? What, what, what's your name? Sorry. Uh, Regina. Um, yeah, it depend on how many vulnerable people are, mm. are actually part of your like, office demographic. And vulnerable being over X age. Yeah, over X age or under X age. Diabetes, asthma. So what do you say? Yeah. People with diabetes, people with asthma, yeah. people are in that high risk category. That's the consideration, isn't it? And so then, and then, but then how do you do that? With flu, you know, you have to take into consideration what's the population. But if someone comes in to the office, you're kind of exposed already, aren't you, in that situation? So you have to put a different plan into place, I think. But are you saying that you would then be able to say, look, if I'm a diabetic or if I'm a, let's say, a man of a certain age, <laughs> that I would then say, look, I'm not going to come into the office, but everybody else does? I don't think it's that black and white, is no. it? And I think it's that straightforward. You, know, you have to... You make decisions based on the information you have at that point in time, and, and everything else is conjecture. And also, somebody in this room could have influenza, yeah. right? And we don't know. No. So, it's like you should take the risk to turn up to work every day, and if you feel like you're not well, yeah. then uh, self isolate. That's well, I just like to say, from here, you all look terrific. <laughs> <laughs> that's, my, that's my diagnosis. So, you, were you about, so you're about to say something? Um, yeah. I think one of the worst things. Like, so, would you say your name? Sorry. Uh, my name's Sophie. You're Sophie, yeah. I think one of the worst things is. If you walk down Chinatown, you go into some of the Chinese restaurants. I bet they're completely empty at the moment because people are scared of going in to eat in Chinese restaurants in London. And realistically, how many people in that Chinese restaurant have got coronavirus? Probably none of them. But actually, the financial implications for all of those businesses, because people in the UK are going a bit crazy because there's the flu that could be the flu, but it could be something that's even worse, but we don't know, is then meaning that these people, their, eco their mini economy is. Under threat, actually, yeah. but, but, can I say, the, but the thing that's difficult about that, so I, I spoke to someone, I was in an Uber the other day, and they were explaining to me that when they picked up people from the airport, there's a real problem that people with Chinese names are not getting picked up by Uber drivers, mm -hmm. right? And obviously you think, oh, that's awful, but you also think, oh, I bet you that, you know, if you were driving Uber and you had two different jobs at the same time, and you were worried about flights coming in from China, it wouldn't be the strangest thing. I mean, I just think people behave in a sort of fearful but rational way. Sorry, ma'am, you were going to say? I was just saying it depends on the nature of the work as well. So I think if the work is reasonably flexible, yeah. it, it makes sense to be slightly more cautious. Um, so on a healthcare organisation at the moment, we've been quite cautious because the implications if the virus comes into the setting mm -hmm. is much higher. But I think if the nature of the work can be done at home, then it's it's reasonably straightforward to be slightly more conservative. Yeah. Uh, and so what's your name? Valerie. And Valerie, but presumably healthcare work, a lot of it, you actually do need to be face to face with people. Yeah, exactly. So for now, because uh, the numbers are uh, small, we can be more cautious. So we're actually encouraging people to stay at home um, if, they, if they're worried about the area that they've travelled to, even if they're not symptomatic, simply because if the virus comes into the settings that we're working in, yeah. then the implications are huge people are vulnerable. Yeah. But clearly, as, as things might progress, then that might become unsustainable because we'll need the resources in the services.
Can, can I can ask you about just about kind of modern leadership of enormous organisations? Because I, you, the, the point you made right at the beginning, which is you're a citizen, and you're presumably in these circumstances waiting on government, rather hoping that government is going to take the lead. But the reality of it is that the ask from employees comes before the answer from government. Do you, in those circumstances, end up finding that essentially the choice is yours, that as much as you wish to find advice from government or advice from in-house lawyers, that in the end on something like this, I'm sorry to hear your name, <laughs> Emma, so that, you know, to Emma's point, it's actually it's a complicated choice, but it's one that you have to make. Yeah, I think it evolves iteratively, in truth. Uh, as you say, sometimes you're a little bit ahead of where government are on some issues, or there's a little bit of a vacuum, and you try to um, do the right thing. You know, common sense uh, is helpful. Um, you, you opened up by talking about morality. I mean, most organizations have a set of values, a set of behaviors, uh, and so you try to make decisions in this example consistent with those values and those behaviors. I mean, the point earlier was interesting. Of course, you know, work that you can do from home, do it from home, non-essential, you know, don't travel, video conference and so on. I was always conscious of Tesco where you had, you know, 500,000 people, 200,000 in the UK who had to be frontline, that you needed to be there as well. It wasn't, even though you might have said, I, you know, I can video conference. There's, and, 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 and for a lot of the public services uh, and other industries, um, you know, you need to be alongside people who have to be present in the workplace. Yeah, they have to be there. Could, could, we, could, could we go, uh, you know, when we first asked you to come and do this, um, actually, I think our, our real focus was trying to understand the subject that we hit on right at the beginning, which is what's happened to the, the nature of the consumer. And I just wondered whether or not we could get a sense from you of or the extent to which, to answer that initial question, things really have changed, whether or not you think the consumer has changed. Um, it's a little early to say. I, I suspect that they are changing. And, and the direction in which they're changing, um, I, I would describe like this. First of all, when you look around the world, and I was privileged you know, to do business in, in all the continents, apart from Antarctica, um, the, 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 um, the, there's a universal desire for a better life. And, and you, you, the, the, I think that's hardwired into the human species. And I, and I think it, it, it's, it's, it's futile to think that that's going to alter. Um, people uh, want to uh, progress. It, it's part of survival. Uh, what may be happening is a change to how that's defined, what progress means. And uh, I, I wrote Tesco's environment policy in 2007, and. Uh, uh, actually, I'm very pleased with the progress that has been made and we set out to be carbon neutral by 2050 back then, and now that tends to be sort of the benchmark mm -hmm. for businesses. Um, and we carbon labelled all of our supply chains and products and so on and so forth, so we knew the full sort of environmental externalities. But honestly, what, what we were trying to encourage back then was the idea of sustainable consumption. And you couldn't actually see it in the consumer. Actually, businesses were ahead of consumers on the subject. Uh, I think you're beginning to see it now. Uh, I, I think you're beginning to see consumers value different forms of consumption and beginning to value sustainable consumption, where you know the externality over um, conspicuous consumption or value-based consumption where you don't care about the, you know, the, the, the total environmental cost. But I think that's quite recent. As I say, it wasn't there 10 years ago. And, wh and what do you say? We've had <clears throat> here, just in the last few months, I remember we had Natalie Bennett from the Green sitting in this chair here a few weeks ago. We had some uh, the team from Extinction Rebellion here a few weeks back. And, and part of their argument is that it's fundamentally with engines of consumption like 
Tesco, like the high street, and arguing that it, it, it's one thing to have sustainable consumption, we also just need to have less consumption. Is that feasible, given your human nature point? I, I think you, you, it, you won't hold back the desire for a better life. I think what you can do is reframe what a better life is for people. <coughs> Uh, and you can make green cool and desirable in the way that, uh, uh, you know, luxury handbags have been cool and desirable in the past. Uh, you, you can make a, a, a small electric car desirable in the way a big Bentley has been desirable for some people in the past. So I think, I think you, can, you can change what people desire and the things that they desire might be more sustainable, more environmental. That can happen. But I, I honestly don't think you can say to people, don't wish for a better life, don't wish to advance. Um, I think that's you. And, and when you weigh it, Terry, when you weigh the efforts to make sustainable consumption more appealing, cool, versus you know what's happened in our lifetimes around the the accessibility of what were once luxury items, avocados, yeah. the, the the sort of the industrialization of avocado production, so that it's available at all times, everywhere, for everyone. Yeah. You know, it's, it, it, it has transformed water supply, it's transformed farming, yeah. it's transformed national economies, and that's one particular product yeah. on the shelf. I mean, are we kidding ourselves at, and just sort of making ourselves feel good when we talk about sustainable consumption? Is the system unsustainable? Um, <clears throat> it's hard to know. I, funnily enough, the, a lot of the debate's not informed by facts, isn't it? I mean, the, 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 the sort of standard way into this is we're using the resources of three planets, aren't yes. we? So clearly there's a huge amount uh, to go. But, but, but I've found where we have looked uh, in, in uh, areas that we know about in, say, retailing and global supply chain, there's huge opportunity to conserve resources. And, and one of the, um, you know, one of the best ways into this is conservation. Um, businesses that don't waste things actually are very profitable businesses. Mm -hmm. um, if they look after staff, if they look after customers, if they look after the resources that are employed in the business, look after their relationships and so on. Um, actually, uh, that's consistent both with profitability and with um, uh, environmental conservation. Um, I mean, if you look at the big things, you know, um, obviously uh, power generation, uh, the use of uh, fossil fuels in uh, transport, uh, farming, deforestation, um, heating homes, you know, uh, badly insulated homes. Individually, those things can be addressed, I think. Uh, so I don't think we're making, obviously, we're not making anything like fast enough progress, but, uh, but I, think, I think it can happen. And, and do you think, and please do everyone, I mean, I hope in the course of this conversation we're going to touch on climate, we're going to think about the high street, we're going to touch, as I said, a bit on social mobility, but right now, if people have views on what, what, what's happening on climate, please do weigh in. So, what would you say your name? Uh, Ollie. Ollie, yes. I was researching uh, CSR and what consumers thought about... Can people hear Ollie? Yeah. I, was, I was researching CSR and what consumers thought about sustainability in the early 2000s. And the research we were doing was finding that kind of price trumped everything for the majority of consumers. There was a cost to care. And, then the, and that was exacerbated around the financial crisis. But I do see that there's some of the research we're looking at now, there's a bit of a shift, actually, not so much the cost-to-care element and people are taking that off the table. I wonder whether... That, I wonder whether... I mean, is that, is, that, is that your judgment, too, that there is some price elasticity around these issues? Well, I agree with Ollie that, 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 that <coughs> you went back in the early 2000s, you wouldn't see something. You're beginning to see something now in pockets. Yes. Uh, but, but, but I think... We desperately need better information about the behaviour changes that make the biggest difference. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, it, 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 
it's a terrible waste if someone lives in a badly insulated house and then goes and protests about growing roses in Africa. Yes, you yeah. Know, uh, it'd be far better to go and make your house properly insulated. Um, or, uh, you know, has to commute 100 miles to work every day. You know, working out those sorts of issues. So, so, so I, think, I think we all of us need just better practical information about where lifestyle changes make a, a big difference in terms of sustainable consumption. Can, can, can I ask you about that? So one of, the, one of the conversations that we've had, and it's gone a little bit, to be honest with you, Terry, around the house, is, is how do you, how do you like, mark the homework of the CEO? How do you make sure that the incentives for chief executives correspond to what we want as outcomes for business? <clears throat> it's extremely difficult, actually, uh, and I do worry about it. I, I, I think that, um, you know, limited companies are great invention, uh, spreading risk, uh, has allowed everybody to participate, to own a part of great uh, enterprises. Um, but, <clears throat> but they do tend to fragment ownership. Uh, and so at its worst, as you, you can have these huge organizations like a Glaxo or a Tesco or a, or a, or a BP uh, sitting there, and, and they've not really any owner to speak to in terms of you know, what is the strategic direction this business should take. And so you're taking soundings from stakeholders, you know, from government, from unions, from staff, from shareholders, from the media, and trying to, you know, set a course. And that, that, that is a problem, I think. Because, but just expand on that. Because in a, what I would interpret from you saying that is that to an extent then the chief executive can quote unquote take those soundings, but then draw from those soundings a judgment of what matters in her or his mind, i.e. there is not an ownership that, that stamps on the CEO, this is what, these, are, these are the outcomes we want for the business. Yeah, I think that's, that's that the difficulty, yeah. And, so, and, th and this is the great critique of capitalism and today. Because remember that, that you know, shares change hands at an incredible rate. I mean, I think the entire, I think the entire equity holding of Tesco changed hands every six months. <coughs> Uh, and I'd been in there for 30 years. And so you have a completely different sense of commitment to an organization. Yes. Uh, and, and it should be the other way around. It should be that the owner is the one who's really committed to the long-term health and contribution of the business and hires the management to carry out those policies. And that is difficult in, in limited companies. But, but what that would suggest is that there is something, that, that there's an opportunity for self-dealing in that structure that that needs to be addressed yeah yeah I think how so. would you well <coughs> I, I, I think that um, as <coughs> yeah, pension funds insurance funds family offices agglomerate into their investments they're usually managed by somebody yes and, and I think those professional managers probably need to take a a more visible leadership role in working, in, in reinterpreting where society is headed uh, and, and giving signals to organizations they invest in that, that we, we think that's how you should respond to the direction of travel. But, but you, I mean, uh, I, th I think Bob Iger's coming through town this week. You know, Bob Iger became a story unto himself about CEO pay. I think it was 1,400 times median pay in Disney. Mm. And, and what, you, what, what you describe as a system that, to an extent, enables that to happen. Presumably, th there's no system in which the owners are going to be the ones who step in and be the regulators of that, of that pay. It's going um, to have to be someone external. Well, well, no, I think that the owners could step in and be the regulators. I'm saying that in the structure... Mm. Uh, they tend not to because each individual shareholder says, well, I'm a tiny slice yes. uh, of this business. Or if it's grouped up in a, you know, a great uh, pension fund or asset manager, they say, well, I'm just, you know, I'm just uh, an, an executive officer of that fund and I, you know, I, I'm just looking to maximize 
returns in the short term. But, but, but I think those people could see themselves more as an owner in a traditional sense. And, if you, and, and I suppose the, the reason why I think this has come back, the, the pay issue has come back, is also about other outcomes and expectations of the CEO. And one of the things that is striking is how do you, how do you measure, how do you reward a chief exec on what their outcomes are on emissions, on biodiversity, on overall fairness and opportunity? How, how, how right is that, Terry, that we should look to chief executives to have a sense of public outcomes over and above financial performance? I think it is right. I mean, at Tesco, we had a thing called the steering wheel. Uh, it was actually borrowed from Robert Kaplan many years ago, which is incredibly powerful within the business. And all of the measures that we had to progress in our business were captured by this simple steering wheel. And it had five parts to it. What were we going to, what were we going to do for the customer? What were we going to do for our staff? what we were going to do to innovate in the workplace, actually what we do make it better, what we were going to do for our communities that we were in, and what were we going to do for our shareholder. So actually the shareholder was one, only one-fifth of what we spent our time on. Sadly, if you had a conversation with the shareholder, yeah. he would view it as being 95% of what we spend <laughs> our time on, and that's all they were interested in having a conversation around. But, but, but I think it is possible to expect the owner, the shareholder, to be interested in the other, in the other things as well. And I, and I suppose my question is the extent to which you can actually measure. You take, let's take that fourth one, communities. Mm -hmm. Is there a way you think you can sensibly measure what the business is delivering for those communities and therefore sort of link your your pay, your longevity in the job, to that performance? Yeah, I think you can. I mean, clearly, you know, you're working off 100 years of getting uh, uh, <coughs> measures of uh, financial return, but, but these other areas can be measured. And actually, all the work we did around uh, sustainable consumption was measurable. Yeah. Uh, so, you here, let me... Yeah, hi, um, hi, Sir we, what, What's your name? Uh, my name's Fleur Shepherd. I was on the Corporate Affairs Graduate Scheme. I, I got the job just before you announced you were leaving, but joined, uh, joined after the announcement. And the first time we were in a room together, you very refreshingly told us as a bunch of grads that um, we shouldn't get too big for our boots and we should remember who we were responsible to, you know, the stakeholders within the wheel. Um, and I know how people used to measure the balance wheel. And I wonder if if you ever felt a sense of conflict about those different stakeholders. So I joined Tesco because I wanted to, I'm a sheep farmer's daughter, wanted to work within the food supply chain. Retail was the most exciting part of that. I think Tesco was the biggest. Um, but I felt all the time a conflict between the great jobs and huge numbers of jobs that we provide for people across the country, the great quality food at affordable prices that people would be able to buy to feed their families, um, and then the, the supply chains that we were sustaining in the UK and abroad. But I also felt really uncomfortable about the fact that every deal that was on the shelf edge was being paid for by somebody else in that supply chain rather than us with our margins because we had to sustain our colleagues and everybody else. And I want, if, if I felt that as a 21-year-old grad, I wonder how you felt about that when you obviously had all these other pressures as well. Is, that, well, is, it, is it Flea, did you say? Flea, it's Welsh, it's hard. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, there are trade-offs. Uh, but but at, least, at least with the steering wheel, you have the trade-offs on the page right in front of you. And so you're not just driving hard towards one measure. And when businesses go wrong, that's what happens, they just look at one measure, and maybe to some extent executive pay has been a bit caught up in that. Uh, so at least you know what's important in the business, and it includes the consumer, it includes the, the, the supplier and the people who do the job of work and so on. And then you, then you can, you, you know, you're better placed to make those trade-offs. And it is extremely difficult. Um, on the one hand, you had the Welsh sheep farmer, uh, and if you were trying to do a great job on lamb, uh, the consumer just wants the lamb as cheap mm -hmm. as possible because they've got a, they struggle to get to the end of the week with their wages. 
But on the other hand, uh, you might be selling toothpaste from Procter & Gamble, one of the world's largest, most profitable organizations, and you're, in a way, defending the consumer and buying on behalf of the consumer in front of this great organization. And, and so you almost got to wear a different mask according to which type of supply you were dealing with. But yeah, there, there are trade-offs the whole while. Just out of interest, did your family, when you went to work in Tesco, <coughs> think that you'd sort of switch sides <coughs> if you were part of a sheep farming community in Wales? Yeah, they think West not, my, was... not my parents, so they were very proud and very pleased and they're quite forward thinking. My dad got a contract with Sainsbury's by phoning up and asking to speak to Justin Rose at the time. Right. So he was great, but the, I mean, lots of my uncles and aunties still think that I'm a bit of a traitor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll have you your thoughts on this on the consumer because I'm a, I want to turn um, I, I want to, so I want, do, do just catch my eye if you want to say something. I, I wanted to turn, turn if, we, if we could, turn to this question about, about the nature of Britain. And th there are two great agendas, I think, if you uh, look at what's happening today in our country. One is obviously making a success of Brexit, and the second one is what's used in the jargon as levelling up, but dealing with the really profound now structural unfairnesses within the country. C can, you, can we talk a bit about the, the work you did around Liverpool and, and, and what you learnt and what is reasonable to expect of intervention and what, and what won't be delivered by, by interventions? Yeah, I, I, I was on the regeneration board for Liverpool for more than 10 years, from about 2000, and, and also wrote a report on the city with Michael Heseltine for David Cameron. Um, it, I mean, it, it broadly, it was a very successful intervention, and it was a public-private intervention, actually. Um, I think it was at its best when um, the, you had strong uh, local government uh, and they mobilised local business and, you know, civil society actually uh, behind a vision uh, for for improvement. Now, Liverpool's was based on f actually began with physical regeneration because Liverpool was a very beautiful city. If you've never been there, you should go. And yeah, because it was incredibly prosperous in the 19th century, has some wonderful buildings and institutions. Uh, and, and, so, and, and it has a relatively small city centre, so it made sense to concentrate on, on, on physical regeneration. Uh, and that pump primed four or five billion pounds of largely private uh, money into wonderful... 40% uh, of the city centre was rebuilt. Yeah. Wonderful shopping centre, uh, conference centre, hotels, apartments, offices, everything else. Um, and, and, and actually, then the next stage, although this was less successful, would be a strategy for economic renewal. Um, and uh, although that's never quite fallen into place, uh, the city economically has done much better in the last 20 years as a result of uh, a public-private intervention. What I found was that uh, the city had become cut off Mm. from the rest of the economy. And this is what you find time and time and time again with these towns and communities that struggle. The, that the reason that they existed has been lost, the single industry. In Liverpool's case, it was the port. And the port had nearly closed. And you see this, you know, in St. Helens, it was the glassworks, and that's mm. nearly closed. And, and, and you can go on, you can name the towns. Um, and, and as a result, they've been cut. People don't go there. Uh, people don't start businesses there, and so it goes on. So the, the key thing is you've got to find a way of reconnecting that community with the rest of the economy, with the rest of society. Uh, anything. Now, in Liverpool's case, it, tend, it, it began with tourism and the visitor economy. Uh, and, uh, and, and sport actually made a difference. Uh, and then it, you know, Liverpool was relatively lucky. It was big enough and had the scale and, and the name that there were still some industries like marine industries and life sciences and a good university and, and, and building blocks that you could use. And, and, and what's the answer to it? Because part, part of the <coughs> argument, and it's obviously not just a UK issue, it's an issue around the industrialised world, that 
whether it's St Helens losing its glassworks or Stoke losing its potteries or Liverpool, yeah. as you say, losing its port, the, the fact is we're looking at the same thing again and again, yeah. which is deindustrialization combined with the network effects of a digital economy, meaning that you cannot, if you like, rebuild those economies with the same kind of engines at the heart of them, not just big cities like Liverpool, but market towns too. What, what's, the, what's the sort of bigger structural answer to that? Well, I, I think the, the, the big hope is that, I mean, I mean, the big problem is that they lost their industries 50 years ago and, and successive governments left and right have never fundamentally addressed that problem. And for a period of time, service jobs and retail jobs sort of helped, but they're not being created at the same pace. The big hope is the digital economy because you, you, can, you can run the digital economy from virtually anywhere and actually the quality of place matters uh, and people can choose to go and develop their business in Manchester or Liverpool or Bristol or whatever because they like it there. It's actually these small cities work extremely well. Uh, schools are good, housing it doesn't cost so much, there are nice institutions, you can get around and see friends easily. Uh, and there's enough going on, you know, the contacts are, are there. So, so that's the big hope, and, and probably the best example of that is, is in, you know, Edinburgh, uh, Manchester especially, Bristol, where that's clearly working. I mean, somebody said there's 160,000 digital job vacancies in Manchester alone at the moment. And, and, what, do you, and what do you think about the... I think there's a, there's a trend that's more than fear-mongering around the digital economy and the hollowing out of employment that, in essence, you're right, there are great opportunities if you can get those jobs, but those jobs are going to be few and the wealth they create is going to be concentrated in the hands of the few, that they, won't, they fundamentally won't employ as many people and that this automation employment problem is going to play out particularly in those towns and cities. Yeah, that is a concern. I mean, I mean, the, the, as you know, the the the, the um, more sanguine view is that actually jobs are destroyed all the time. There's something like ten percent of all jobs in the economy change every year. So, even if say the digital economy made redundant forty percent of jobs, that wouldn't actually be so remarkable in terms of how eco economies are able to renew themselves. And digital jobs, and they're not small employers. You know, if you look right across the full spectrum of uh, digital work, it employs a, a lot of people. Uh, and then clearly other things matter much more. So, you know, if you are doing really well as a, as a, as a software engineer and you're earning in Manchester £130,000, all of a sudden you're interested in a personal trainer or going to a nice hotel or... Uh, making sure someone can look after your mum and things like that. And so you start then to employ those, uh, those service jobs. Right. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. So, so what, what, what's your so answer? And Andrew Gore. Andrew. I, yeah, I'd agree, Good, connecting some things here, that the digital economy provides the, the platform for smaller craft foods, smaller fashion businesses, local retail, local services. Because the easy stuff has been done by Silicon Valley. The difficult stuff now about insulating people's homes, putting solar panels, putting charge points for electric vehicles, they've got a technical platform, but we're going to need people to be able to roll those out, service them, care for elderly people. So I think you know, the, the chances for decentralising these services and all that is going to become more available. And so we need to get that trend. So do you think that the... I think if we were having this conversation even just a year ago, we would have reached already for the discussion about the universal basic income. Are we going to have to offset the decline in people's incomes with some kind of payment by the state to do that? Do you think that was just, if you like, a reflex that, that was born of our uncertainty about the future? Or do you think that there is going to be genuinely a wide regeneration of opportunity through digital economy? And there's that opportunity to be able to have that wider regeneration. The role of um, companies and governments and society in being able to do that, I think is good. they're going to have to join together to be able to do it. Yeah. I do quite a bit in China, 
and I think what China have done with their regions, with Alibaba helping local digital businesses and Taobao villages, and what the, the government has done in being able to provide, you know, basic infrastructure, homes, and sort of stuff like that. I think you know that there might be some examples in that for it. And if we see supply ch side squeezes and demand side squeezes now because of the virus, it would be interesting to see what China does and what Hong Kong is doing to pump money into individuals as opposed to pumping money into the markets in inverted commas. So, you know, all of those things need to be taken into account. So Manchester, Liverpool, Edinburgh and all that, I think have got great opportunities in those areas. I mean, there's, a, there's a delicious irony here, isn't there, which is for years, Terry, Tesco was, if you like, the whipping boy in the arguments around what's happening in the hollowing out of high streets, what's going to happen in the centre of our, particularly our kind of market town economies. And now actually people are looking at companies that do have a truly national reach to try and figure out how we do regenerate those economies. Uh, I think, I think companies that do have a reach, whether they're banks or retailers uh, uh, or, or linked to the great hospitals or whatever, can play an important role in this levelling up discussion because they're there in the communities. And, you know, you get your first job in the local shop or in the local employer. And so if those people are on the ground, they can make, they can make a big difference. So there's a gentleman here. Uh, uh, Would you say your name? So I think part of this comes back to like what is the purpose of big business. So I think it's relatively easy to map out some sort of like stakeholder grid of balancing your community and your shareholders. It's a lot harder to have sort of a clarity of vision and a clarity of purpose around um, what you what your business means to those individual groups, except for shareholders, where total shareholder return is a really easy metric metric to measure, and therefore is the metric that you're going to manage to. Whereas I think what we're seeing is, is sort of like a rebalancing of businesses where they're realising that they're going to have to navigate that complexity and figure out what does your business mean to your communities, to your employees, to your customers. Um, and, and without that clarity of purpose, you're going to struggle to manage. And so if you're opening a new big Tesco store in Liverpool, well, what does that mean to the people that you're going to be employing in Liverpool? Um, is that going to be a source of sort of stable, sort of like, good wage employment for those, for those people? Is that going to be a, a lifeline that might be slightly below that benchmark? And neither of those things are right or wrong, but without having that clarity of vision, of purpose of what your business is going to mean to those people you're employing, I think it's difficult to sort of chart a path through that strategically. Perhaps. Yeah, I mean, it is difficult, um, but you can do it. And I mean, my background really is data. Uh, and. Uh, Honestly, our measures on consumers and customers were far more sophisticated than around finance. And so we had a much, much greater sense in detail and quantified in terms of what we were trying to do for customers and how <coughs> benefit was, being deli was delivered to customers. Um, and, and clearly, Tesco, like all, it was, it was a private, profit-making organization. But that's actually a very good discipline. But as long as you understood that the true value went into the organization from customers. And so you could only be successful in shareholder terms or if you were first successful in customer terms. But, but Terry, can you talk a bit more about that? Because I think if you, if you were picking apart the arguments we're currently having about data in society and usage of data, we could learn a lot from club card, right? and, I, and I suppose I have two big questions about it. One is, all of the issues around privacy, how did you think about those? And then the other one is, if you can learn that much from data, are we doing a lousy job in our public services of applying the data that is potentially available to improve the quality of what people get? Yeah, I, I mean... Um and some people say Club Card was the birth of big data, which, which uh, um, may not have been meant as a compliment. <laughs> uh, but but um, it goes back now 25 years. Um, I, think, I think we approached it in the right way. I, I mean, the, 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 the purpose of Tesco was expressed simply as to create benefit for customers in order to earn their lifetime loyalty. Uh, and everything came from that. And so when we were able to do 
club card, and we could only do it then because computers only became powerful enough then to be able to do it. Um, we, we actually wanted to use the information to be useful to the customer rather than useful to us. It's just a mindset. Um, and we did a couple of things which proved to be important long term, and it was a very innocent time then around data. And none of these discussions that you have now were being had then. But we, we, we said that we would never give the data to anybody else. Um, uh, and so that was quite different to how Silicon Valley grew up, whereby they monetized the data. Uh, and the second thing was we would anonymize the data from the outset. Uh, and, and those two things, I think, keeping control of the data and anonymizing it properly, meant that we avoided problems. And actually, if you look at the history of Club Card over 25 years, there have been virtually no issues around um, uh, data privacy. I think there was one issue in South Korea about uh, 10 years ago. It's been remarkable. What, but what about the, what about the other half of it? User I remember, data. yeah, user data. I remember there was a, I remember there was a time, Terry, when you were looking at the NHS, and the government asked you to look at the NHS. And one of the things that you looked at was, what would happen if you if you priced procedures so that the, you, the individual, the, the patient, would be able to understand what the inputs were yeah. that you were the beneficiary of. But I remember thinking about that a lot, thinking actually, there's a whole mindset here about how do you apply the kind of retail habits things like club card to public services. Yeah. I, we, we, it was sort of helpful to have the comparison that the food industry, which is vital, was about the same size as the health care industry, which is also vital. Uh, but they were organized differently. So, so um, distribution was separate from manufacturing in food, but, but, but it was integrated in health care. In, 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 there was a comp competition in, in food, there was not in, in healthcare, and there was a pricing mechanism in food, but there isn't in healthcare. So, you know, it was interesting to compare uh, and, and to, you know, to contrast. Um, uh, honestly, I think even today, data, there's huge amount of data, both in industry and in the public sector, but businesses, organizations struggle to use it effectively. Uh, so, so uh, yes, there is an opportunity for um, the public service to use data to uh, serve uh, citizens better, um, and I know that you know the thinking about how best to do that. Um, but the same also applies to uh, to private organisations. And, and what and I guess the thing that is a puzzle to me is what the interaction should be between the two. So I. I don't know what Jeff Bezos is doing, right? Because he has, and Amazon has, information on me and I guess the vast majority of people in this room at a scale that is nothing by, com like, obviously far outstrips the public sector. But we're not marshalling it for any public good, as far as I can see. And I just wonder whether you think we should. Yes, we, we should, yeah. And, um, uh, Actually, the NHS is, is, is in a better starting position than almost any other healthcare organisation because it's a single, it has the potential to be a single body and, uh, uh, you know, it can pool data. I mean, unfortunately, it's run aground on data privacy issues. Uh, but if we could find a way to get beyond that, the, the use of that data could be incredibly powerful. And, and in pockets, it is being used incredibly well in terms of uh, studying individual diseases and so on. Um, but the problem at the minute is that there is too much data for humans or organ groups of humans to manage. And so it, it feels like we're going to need the next level of artificial intelligence to come in to be able to to manage that data more effectively and make it more useful. Can, can I, just in the final moments that we've got, um, it feels like as a country we are going through a messy divorce and whether we think it's the right or wrong thing that mum and dad are breaking up, we just don't talk about it anymore. <laughs> but, but, but what do you feel, practically speaking, is, is what business needs to do now in response to or in, to, to make a success of Brexit? Do you, do you think we just have to sort of sit and wait and and see how it plays out? Well, I mean, 
I, I voted to remain. Uh, I, I was never a great lover of the European institutions, but I felt the friction costs were just too great. Uh, uh, but, you know, we, we, we've incurred those costs now. Uh, so I, I would more take the view that it would be better to define ourselves more clearly as being outside the European Union and accept the full consequences of that, uh, some of which are a little bit daunting. Uh, and, and I think, it, you know, if we're honest then with uh, ourselves and say, okay, in this world it's going to be a bit of a colder place, but we can do very well, but we need to understand what we'll need to do to do well. And a lot of that will be around, honestly, benchmarking, competition, competitiveness in, in all parts of society. You know, what makes cities successful, what makes firms successful, what makes universities successful. Uh, and really be able to measure it and uh, know who's the best and set about making yourself the best. And I think, you know, obviously more emphasis on investment in infrastructure, more emphasis on investment in the right type of education. Everyone should learn coding. Uh, 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 and making full use of, you know, all of the talents uh, in terms of so social mobility matters tremendously. Uh, and the levelling up agenda. So that, I mean... What, the great gift that the UK has is London. Uh, and I've never bought in as a northerner to this idea that London is a problem for the north. Non London is a great gift to the north. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's how the north then uh, responds and, 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 and works with that. So, so uh, as you will see, I'm afraid, that Agatha has, as, mm -hmm. as predicted, kind of <laughs> shot through the finishing tape. We, we, we did one thing which I suppose pulls all of this together. We... We, we tried about a year ago to think about how would you change the behaviours of business given the debate about capitalism. And one of the things we tried to do was see if you could measure the behaviour of the FTSE 100 against the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And we created an index called um, the Responsibility 100. And it was fundamentally about trying to measure how responsible businesses are. And out of that, we've started something new called the Responsible Business Forum, which is all about what you talk about. It's all about how do you... It's not, it's not saying this is what businesses should or shouldn't do. It's about actually measuring what they do. It's about what they, what they inspect, if you like. When you stand back from it now, given what you did in 2007 thinking about the environment, when you stand back from it and you think, what are we not measuring in terms of business outputs or business impacts? What would you think we should with this Responsible Business Forum, what do you think we should actually focus on in terms of measurements that we're currently missing? Well, I, I, I think <clears throat> it, it probably would go back to the meat of some of the discussion about the steering wheel and beginning to get hard, crunchy measures around those other segments of the steering wheel. You know, what are you really doing for consumers and sustainable consumption? What are you doing for the communities you operate in? What are you doing for your workers, including social mobility and mm -hmm. so on, and training and uh, skill development? Uh, so, so a more rounded set of measures uh, for businesses. And actually, I think businesses would welcome that, because the worst thing as a business is to be buffeted along by a debate uh, and criticism that you can never quite get your hands around and say, no, this is where we stand on that issue. So I think that's the opportunity. OK. Terry, thank you very much. If you've not been to a thinking before, at the end of it, rather like a news, news meeting, the editor, happily me, gets to say, OK, well, this is where we would probably take it. And I, and I think, for what it's worth, today I think there are two really, really solid things that we should, that we should take from it. Uh, Funny if I really was struck listening to you say, and I know you've said it many times before, what Tesco's purpose was, because I hadn't clocked something about it that is incredibly obvious, which is that it was built around a consumer interest, a customer interest, rather than an institutional interest. And I think that actually as a way, as a lens of thinking about how businesses behave, those that are serving people rather than themselves, it's actually quite an interesting lens. And I think increasingly it's the thing that distinguishes companies. It's where their starting point is, that self-interest versus the public one. But the thing for us I think that's most interesting is actually probably to go back and take a look at Club Card. 
because the, the curious thing is that we are really interested now, I think, in how we can use data to measure impacts of businesses. And there have been few cases that have created real public confidence in the use of data where people think it is good for them as, good, as well as good for overall outcomes. And so probably the small piece of journalism will come out of this is actually to something that is not so forward-looking, but as you say, goes back uh, nearly a generation. So for that and that idea, thank you. Uh, thank you too, Terry, for, for coming and joining us. One of the things that we're trying to do with Tortoise is make sure that the things that happen over time are scrutinised as well as the breaking news, the events that happen in the day-to-day, -day, and getting the perspective that you've given us has been really, really helpful and uh, illuminating. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Sir Terry Williams.